one of the hottest selling horror paperbacks in the summer of 2021 happens to be a Bantam book from 1983, a nonfiction. It's valuable, it's coveted, it's rare. Let's go into the reasons why. Recently I've been gathering and categorizing a lot of my occult and hauntings strange happenings all my non-fiction type of paranormal and supernaturals the Edgar Casey's the Hans Holzer's the pseudosciences all into this nice little bookshelf that led to my research on some recent sales of what's been going on to my astonishment, I found some exorbitant sales in the nonfiction category. We're talking Curtis Richards level sales. In early July 2021, the only listing, active listing, on eBay for The Devil in Connecticut was for $1,500. And tracking back a few months, there had been nearly a dozen sales of the book ranging from a hundred dollars to a few hundred dollars. Now the cover for The Devil in Connecticut is unremarkable and bland. It's one of those staged photos where it's a white suburban home, doorway ajar, emitting a glowing mist. So it didn't really stand out to me, but it evoked a spark of a memory for it. I said, I. I think I might have that book. At my house, I have thousands of books, but I'm still not able to store and archive every book in my collection, so I have them in deep storage at different places. So I poured over all my books at home. I know I didn't have it. I had it in deep storage because I pick up every book with a ghost or a devil on it everywhere I go, and this cover was didn't really stand out to me and so I just put it away and I remember so I come across it every now and then but uh, again I don't look at it too much so I didn't know too much about the book so on the 4th of July I'm searching all my storage bins endlessly for the devil in Connecticut the bland red spine of devil in Connecticut thinking that years ago I bought it and I have it, hoping I have it. Then, as I'm about to give up on it, nestled in between the possession of Joel Delaney and prophets in hell, it emerged in all its paperback from hell glory. The Devil in Connecticut was released in November 1983 by Bantam Books with a retail price of $3.50. It just so happens to be based on the case files that serves as the inspiration for The Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It, released in June 2021. Authored by Gerald Brittle, who had previously collaborated with Ed and Lorraine Warren, on their first book, The Demonologist, released in 1980. Upon examining the back cover, what initially hooked me onto the book was a little blurb by Ed and Lorraine Warren themselves, which reads, Our most shocking case since the Amityville Horror. Similar to the Amityville Horror, this one takes the dual case of devil possession and real life murder. From the prologue, Gerald Brittle clearly states that this data is taken from the victims, the Warrens themselves who served as the chief investigators of this theory, photos and audio tapes of the phenomena during this investigation. For context, it's important to note that Ed and Lorraine Warren were prominently involved in the Amityville Horror case and were even featured in the original 1977 J. Anson book because they were investigators of the house. 
But the movie deals never came, and the Amityville franchise became its own beast, both in fiction and in film. Moving on, in the early 80s, the Warrens continued their exploration into the occult. Now, I have no intention of spoiling the story here, but just plan on giving a overview of the devil in Connecticut itself. The Glatzel family of Connecticut had been experiencing demonic possession, including their young sons. What makes this case particularly stand out is the hierarchical devil possession here, known as the beast is this entity that haunts them, later revealed to be a high-ranking demon. Now, months after attempting to spiritually cleanse this family of the demons, tragedy had struck Brookfield, Connecticut, in a murderous way. Arne Johnson, a friend of the family who had previously provoked the malicious demon, was now charged with the stabbing, brutal murder. Needless to say, the Warrens came rushing back into the town after the case hit the national spotlight. And using their case files, vehemently come into the defense of a murderer claiming demonic possession, claiming he was actually the victim. Regardless of that validity, I find the similitudes to Amityville Horror to be striking. Firstly, the title, The Devil in Connecticut, a locational title, similar to The Amityville Horror. The marketing of a true story and demonic possession, just like in The Amityville Horror. A murderer who claims devilish possession, like Ronald DeFeo. It's almost like a reverse Amityville Horror in its storyline. And lastly, the prosaic prose has all the dryness similar to Jay Anson's Amityville Horror in all its straightforwardness. The police and prosecutors ignored the defense of the Warrens and their claims of demonic possession of murderer Arne Johnson. The book was released a few years later after the murder conviction with heavy controversy involving real-life victims in true events. These and other factors supposedly led to the book itself's suppression of sales and distribution. Decades later, the Warrens and their case files have been revived for film renditions in the Conjuring franchise, one of the more successful horror franchises of the 2010s. The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, is based directly on the case file notes of The Devil in Connecticut. Years after out-of-print obfuscation, the book was finally re-released in concurrence with the film's release in June 2021 by Grey Malkin Media. Despite this newfound access, the original 1983 Bantam Books release remains a hot seller this summer on eBay. I have no critical theories in regards to the events presented by the Warrens in the book, but it is compelling in many facets and its layers. This concludes the story on all that is buzzing about the paperback, The Devil in Connecticut, a non-fiction horror from Bantam Books. This has been a Pulp Arcanum segment by JBM from the Pulp Arcanum Podcast. Search your apps to listen to full episodes.